Welcome back. Getting into a little bit more interesting things, hopefully. You know, away from the lean and other things and that. But let's talk about a contract. We're going to now talk about types of contracts that are used in the real estate business. We may have touched on some of them, or we will be touching on some more of them down the road. But different types of contracts. So what type of contracts are we going to talk about? Listing agreements, buyer's agency agreements, they're a contract, but they're like an employment contract. Options we're going to talk about, leases, sales contracts, those are only a few. So let's move forward. What is a contract? Okay, what is a contract? Well, first, it's important to know how a contract is created, what it means, what is required of the parties, and what kind of action can end it. A contract is the most important document relating to the largest investment a consumer will make in their lifetime, usually. And you, obtaining your real estate license within 90 hours, will be dealing with the most important document. So should you be concerned? Should you take it serious? Yes, you should. Oh, but that's what we have attorneys for. Uh, don't. You know, you're the professional. They come to you to buy and sell or lease property. Let's work with them professionally, OK? A contract will stipulate all aspects of the transaction. A question may arise from time to time. You know what an attorney's going to say or a lender will say? Who's paying for this? Well, what's in the contract? What's in the contract? Without a contract, you do not have a transaction. Just like without your heart, without your heart, would you be here listening to Rosie and talk today on these topics? No, you'd be six feet under, gone, dead, done, over. OK? And we do cover several different laws, more than just a real estate license law. OK? In contracts, we're going to be covering a lot about contract law. A contract has to be a voluntary agreement or promise between two legally competent parties, supported by legal consideration, and to perform or refrain, refrain from performing a certain act, legal act. A contract is a legally enforceable promise. So we have different types of contracts out there. Would you believe that? I'm sure you can believe almost anything from me now. You have expressed and implied. Express contracts, parties state their terms and show their intentions in words. Implied, it's based on your conduct. But in Illinois, see, a listing agreement in Illinois can be verbal, unless it's exclusive. But a sales contract or a lease in Illinois, Illinois statute of frauds, Another law requires a contract for the sale of land and leases that will not be fulfilled within one year from the date they are entered into must be in writing to be enforceable in court. For the sale of land must be in writing to be enforceable in court and any leases that not, will not be fulfilled within one year from the date they are entered into. It has to be in writing to be enforced in court. You could have a contract, but if I don't follow through on what I'm supposed to do, can you sue me in court? No, you can't. Looks like you're learning a few things in there in class. Hmm. So if you don't have something, remember. The Illinois Real Estate License Act of 2000, amended in 2010, also indicates that certain contracts, such as employment agreements between the sponsored licensee and the sponsoring broker, must be in writing. Can't be verbal. OK, so you have different types of contracts. First two type we're types we're going to talk about is bilateral and unilateral. Hmm. Bilateral, by two, means both parties promise to do something. One promise is given in exchange for another promise. I'll sell you my house, and you pay me X amount of money. My promise to you is I'm selling you my property. Your promise to me, you're paying me X amount, OK? Or I'll lease my property to you, and you pay me so much per month for the lease, for the use of my property. Bilateral. Unilateral contracts are one-sided. One party makes a promise to induce a, second, to induce a second party to do something. 
The second party, though, is not legally obligated to perform. You ever heard about an option to purchase? I can give you the option to purchase my house between now and the end of the year, okay? For, let's say, 200000 I created the option, so I'm known as the optionor. You receive the option, you're the optionee. Got it? Who's legally bound? You're not bound. You don't have to buy my house. But I'm bound to the contract, okay? I'm bound to the contract. You can exercise or you can decide, no, forget it. I don't want it. Then we're going to talk about executed exitory. Mm. It's two confusing terms for you. Most of the time you think when you execute a contract, you sign it. Wrong. Not for this course. Okay. Executed contract. Think of somebody being executed. <laughs> Done. Dead. Over. Completed. If you've been executed, you're over with. Correct? Well, executed contract, all parties have fulfilled their promises. At closing, the contract becomes executed. It's done, completed, dead, over with. Okay? Executed. Now, another term you're going to hear is exitory. So tonight, you have your offer accepted on this property. Okay? So you have a contract. The sellers accepted your offer. They signed it. Signed by all parties. Well, you still have to get your mortgage loan. You still have to close. You still have to have your home inspection, etc. Well, you do get equitable interest in the property, but the seller retains legal interest. But you, as the buyer of the property, you have an exitory contract, and the seller has an exitory contract. It's not executed until closing, done, dead, over. Exitory contract when one or both parties still have an act to perform, when something still has to be done. Hopefully that makes a little more sense to you. So for a contract to be valid, there's certain things that have to be in it, okay? First is offer and acceptance. If you just have an offer but you don't have an acceptance, you don't have a contract. An offer by one party, accepted by the other party. The person who is making the offer is called the creator of the offer is the offer or. The person who accepts the offer it's called the offeree. There must be a meeting of minds or a complete agreement about the purpose and the terms. Now, if the offeree counters the offer, that's really a rejection. So now the offeree becomes the offeror, and the offeror becomes the offeree. And we play ping pong, ping pong, until we come to some mutual agreement, a meeting of the minds. Okay, so for one of the essential valid elements of a valid contract is offer and acceptance. An offer is a promise made by one party requesting something in exchange for that promise. The terms of an offer must be definite and specific and must communicate, be communicated to the offeree. Acceptance is a promise by the offeree to be bound by the exact terms proposed. Proposing any deviation whatsoever constitutes a rejection, as I said, and becomes a new offer known as a counter offer. To be valid, you also need consideration, something of legal value offered by one party and accepted by another as an inducement to perform or refrain from some act. A contract must be supported by good and valuable consideration. One thing I'm going to tell you, and one thing you definitely need to remember, earnest money. When we enter into a contract as a buyer, many times we put up earnest money. Earnest money is not. You hear that? Not. N-O-T, not the consideration in a contract. Earnest money is just basically considered a sign of good faith put up the, to the buyer, by the buyer, to the seller, and the sponsoring broker holds it in the escrow account. It's a sign of good faith. So what's the consideration in the contract? Well, I'm paying you 200000 in exchange for your property. The consideration I'm given is 200000 You're giving me the property, correct? So remember, is earnest money consideration? Absolutely not. Reality of consent. The contract must, or, must be entered into as the free and voluntary act of each party. Somebody can't be standing there with a gun to your head saying sign. You have to be legally competent. If You have to be of legal age and have mental capacity to understand the nature and the consequences of your actions. If I think you're crazy, that means nothing. But if you were declared by the court yesterday to be crazy, 
the court declared you mentally incompetent, and today you sign a sales contract, that sales contract is void. Why is it void? Because you're missing one of the essential elements. You're missing the legally competent parties. In Illinois, all individuals become of legal age on their 18th birthday. If somebody prior to the age of 18 enter into a contract before they turn 18, their contracts are voidable until the minor reaches majority and for a reasonable time afterwards. What's the reasonable time? Well, don't leave it up to the courts because the courts will decide the reasonable time. So if you saw somebody, let's take even a car, a used car. How many bought a used car when they were in high school and put it in their name? Well, your mom and dad could have taken that car back to the original person after you banged it up and everything and won, got all their money back. Because if you were under the age of 18, that was voidable. It's a voidable contract. Okay? Keep that in mind. Validity of a contract. Another element of a contract, before I go into the validity of a contract, it has to be for a legal purpose. Okay? It has to be for something legal. I cannot rent a piece of property to grow my funny green plants in, even though you want to split the profits. No way, no how. Not in Illinois, okay? So it has to be for a legal purpose, legally competent. You have to have offer and acceptance. And it has to be in writing to be enforceable, okay? Valid. When a contract meets all the essential elements, it's a valid contract and enforceable. It's void when it has no legal force because it lacks one of those. So if I lease this industrial area to grow all my funny green plants or to have casino night every Friday night, that's illegal without regular things, okay? Do we have a contract? Absolutely not. You can kick me out any time. We don't have a contract. It's void, okay? It's void. Void a bull, though, appears on the surface to be valid, but may be rescinded or disaffirmed by one or both parties. Contract entered into based on duress, or if you were intoxicated and I have you sign a contract. You're under the influence, even though it's easier to get you to accept that, it's voidable. Or a contract entered into based on misrepresentation. I did not disclose I was a dual agent. It's voidable by the party who was deceived. Now, unenforceable seems on the surface to be valid. However, though, neither party can sue to sue the other party to perform. So the statute of frauds in Illinois states that a contract for the sale or lease of real estate, well, for the lease, if it can be done in less than a year, it can be verbal. But if it can't be done within a year, it has to be in writing. And for the sale of real estate, it has to be in writing. So Illinois said basically it has to be in writing. So on this napkin I have, can I write, I, Roseanne Reynolds, will pay you 200000 in exchange for your property, and can we sign it, you and I? Do we have a contract on this napkin? Do we have a contract on this napkin? Yes, we do. Well, it's pretty wide open, though, right? But if I decide I don't want to buy it, can you take me to court and enforce it? Yes, you can. But if you trust me and we verbally accept on a handshake that I'm going to buy your property, and then a the day before closing, I say, no, sorry, Mary, I don't want to buy it. I just found a better one. Can you take me to court then to enforce it? No, because it was verbal. It was verbal. Okay, contracts, discharge of contracts. How are contracts discharged, done, completed? Well, when the agreement is terminated, can a contract be terminated? Well, by mutual agreement, a contract can be terminated. Can all parties agree to terminate this contract? Yes, they can. What about performance, closing, or the end of a lease? Is that the end of the contract? Yeah. Can you assign a contract if it allows an assignment? And assi if you can assign a contract, you're known as the assignor. I receiving the assignment, I'm known as the assignee. Okay? What changes in that contract at that point in time? Nothing except the names. 
You ever have a mortgage loan where they now they told you instead of paying XYZ lender, you're going to pay ABC lender? That was in the time of that contract. Did anything change based on your mortgage payments? Your interest rate? Determine your loan, etc.? No, only who you wrote your check out to. Novation, on the other hand, see it starts with the letter N, novation. It's substituting a brand new contract in place of an existing contract. Maybe an owner, maybe you have a contract to buy this property, but the owner will not allow you to assign it to your brother. Your owner says, you know, you've had my property off the market for a couple months. I'll sell my property to your brother, but I want a new contract because I want more money. So a novation is substituting a new contract in place of the original. Everything can change, okay? Novation starts with the N. New starts with the N. Contract can terminate based on the breach, the violation of any terms or conditions without legal excuse. It can basically be discharged. Now, there are statute of limitations. That means limits on times in which a party to a contract may bring legal suit to enforce their rights. So what are the statute of limitations in Illinois for contracts? If these rights are not enforced within the time frame based on the law, kiss it goodbye. If it's a verbal oral contract, statute of limitation is for five years. Written contract, statute of limitation is 10 years, okay? Up to 10 years after they can still bring suit, 10 years. Wow. Contracts may also be discharged or terminated when any of the other following occurs. Partial performance, they can't perform totally. They can't get the mortgage loan. Or substantial performance, impossibility of performance. A week before the property is supposed to close, the property, the building burns down. Okay? Mutual agreement. I told you, all parties can't agree in writing to terminate a contract. What about operational law? Okay? So if the seller files bankruptcy, can that terminate your sales contract with the seller? Possibly. What if, based on the government's right of eminent domain, two weeks before closing, the seller got a letter from the county stating that they are exercising their right of eminent domain and condemning the property and taking it over within six months? Will that terminate it? Yes. What about rescission? That also will terminate a contract, okay? In Illinois, the Supreme Court decision way back in time because some states you don't need attorneys. They do real estate transactions without attorneys in many states, but not here in Illinois. In Illinois, a Supreme Court decision in Chicago Bar Association versus Quinlan Tyson, which was a real estate company, it put certain limitations on licensees in drafting contracts for the sale of real estate. The courts ruled that a licensee who are not lawyers are only authorized to fill in the blanks and make appropriate deletions on pre-printed contracts that are customarily used in your community. Can you make your own contract or amendments or addendums to the contract for your clients? Absolutely not. You have to use the ones that are customarily used in your area. A licensee may not request or encourage a party to sign any contract that has a blanks in it to be filled in after signing. No, 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 no. You'll be losing your license at that point in time. And two, anybody who signs a contract, any type of contract, whether it be a brokerage agreement, employment agreement, real estate sales contract, lease, whatever, they're required to receive a true copy, a copy of it within 24 hours. Okay? Emailing them a scanned copy, okay. Dropping it in the mailbox, okay. Leaving it by the secretary's desk for them to pick up, not okay. A licensee is prevented from preparing or completing any documents subsequent or implementing the sales contract, such as a bill of sale, affidavit of title. Lawyers in the state of Illinois have to do those. Also in real estate here in Illinois, we cannot use any form that says offer to purchase if it's intended to be binding once they accept the offer. 
years and years and years and years ago, they all said offer to purchase. Well, you know, an offer can be withdrawn any time prior to written acceptance by all parties. Today, our law requires that the forms be clearly headed, real estate contract, real estate sales contract, purchase contract, in bold type. It's required. We talked about earnest money, and I told you, is earnest money required for a contract to be valid? No. Is earnest money the consideration in the contract? No. All earnest money is, is a sign of good faith. And sponsoring brokers that hold earnest money have to establish a special trust or escrow account for the deposit of earnest money. They cannot mix it with their own general funds. The earnest money has to go into a non-interest bearing account. Okay, and if all parties want it in an interest bearing account, it has to have written direction by all parties to put it into an interest bearing account. Plus, that written direction has to be specified who gets paid the interest. And in regular residential real estate, a lot of times you're dealing with such small amounts, the interest is very minute. But sometimes when you go into the commercial lender real estate, you're dealing with large, large amounts of earnest money. And many times at the commercial lender real estate, title companies hold the interest mo earnest money. And sponsoring brokers do not. So you need to know if your sponsoring broker will be holding escrow money or not. All funds must be deposited into the escrow account no later than the next business day following a written acceptance of the real estate contract. And the brokers are to have a true complete record of all escrow account activities. The managing brokers need a true accurate record of all the escrow account activities. Both the account and the records are subject to inspection any time by Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulations. Brokers are strictly prohibited from commingling their own funds with funds in the special account. That's a big no-no. All this hard work you did to get this license, you're going to lose the license a lot faster. Brokers may not use escrow funds for their own personal use. It's illegal. You cannot convert it for your own use. That's called conversion. Illegal. So you're purchasing a property. You got your offer accepted last night, okay? Do you own any title to that property yet? You do. You don't own the property till closing, correct? But currently, you do have equitable title, okay? You will have equitable title. And upon closing, when the contract becomes executed, you will get obtain legal title from the seller. What happens, though, if the property gets destroyed before closing? Well, in Illinois, we have the Uniform Bender Purchaser Risk Act, that if the entire premises or material part is destroyed prior to closing, the seller cannot enforce the contract against you, the buyer. Any earnest money has to be returned to the buyer. But if title or possession has been transferred to the buyer, you have to pay the full contract price. So don't move in until it's closed, okay? We're also going to talk about two new words, an amendment and an addendum. An amend, to mend something, means to change, make a change to an existing contract. Can you change the closing dates? Yes, you can, with all parties' written permission. That's an amendment. Okay, can you add an additional provision to a contract? Add. Addendum, add. Yes, you can with all parties' written direction. Can you write the amendment or the addendum? No. Okay? Your client can, attorneys can. So most of the time now we've been talking about bilateral contracts. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about a unilateral contract again, an option. A unilateral contract, I as the optionor, the owner of the property, owner, optionor, I give you the optionee, the right to buy or lease the property at a fixed price for a certain period of time or within a certain period of time. The optionee pays a fee, the agreed consideration for this option. Option contract is not a sales contract, it's only an option. I, the creator of the option, the optionor, I'm bound to the option. The option E is not bound. They don't have to go through with it. 
once you elect to go through with the option, you, the option, you elect to buy my property, now it becomes a, it's no longer unilateral, it becomes a bilateral exit, exitory contract. It will not be executed until closing because you have certain things to complete. Last type of contract we're going to talk about in this area is a land contract. It has many multiple names. It's typically known as owner financing. That's where you, the owner finances you instead of the lender financing you, owner financing. Under a land contract, the seller, also known as the vendor, not the mortgagee, but if the seller is, retains legal title. The buyer, you as a buyer, you get to take possession. You're known as the vendee, but all you get is equitable title. You as a buyer will obtain legal title once you pay the seller in full, or you go get your own mortgage loan from a lender on it. Up to that, it's owner financing. Many times people who've had bad credit will look for owner financing to purchase a property. And with that, the owner financing, as I said, that finishes up this chapter, and we look forward to seeing you again in our next chapter, in chapter 12. See you shortly.